So we're going to um, give a, um, an overview of co-occurring medical diagnoses um, that we often see um, in our patients who are on um, uh, buprenorphine. And um, the, is it possible to move? Well, sure. it's okay, I can probably see it with the pictures there. So the objectives of this talk are to list the medical screening tests, vaccinations recommended um, for folks who have substance use um, disorders. Thank you. Describe some of the physical health problems that may arise due to the use of alcohol, tobacco, and other substances. Uh, identify potential effects of substances on pregnancy and fetal development and discuss some treatment options briefly um, for some of the disease processes associated with uh, substance use disorders. So recommended screening tests, and this is not, this is not all inclusive, but um, at our clinic, um, at least on intake, um, these are the tests that we include um, because we are um, very concerned about infectious disease. So we include screening upon intake for um, HIV, hepatitis C, uh, tuberculosis, um, and um, that's mainly for our folks who are um, receiving treatment at our methadone window, uh, the tuberculosis test. Gonorrhea, chlamydia, and um, syphilis. Um, there's been a significant rise in, um, in syphilis, uh, and that is um, one of our intake labs as well. Um, we also um, draw a complete blood count and a complete metabolic panel, that's the CBC and CMP, um, because these help us detect consequences of specifically of alcohol use disorder and infectious diseases, but um, also um, oftentimes the medication that we're starting, we would want to get, um, for instance, baseline renal or liver testing, so that's another reason why we get those. And then um, to keep in mind, um, in our integrated clinic, we have primary care, psychiatric care, um, substance use treatment, um, and we um, want to remember to routinely screen um, age appropriate uh, for breast, cervical, and colon cancer. We do tend to see higher rates in people who have uh, co-occurring alcohol and tobacco use disorders. Um, and however, we um, will screen at the recommended USPSTF guideline age. So we'll talk briefly about immunizations. Um, I listed some of them here, um, the Tdap, hepatitis vaccines, influenza, pneumococcal, and then the age-specific vaccines. This next slide is the recent CDC uh, for um, vaccinations of adults with uh, specific conditions. Um, the print here is sort of small, I apologize. Um, and I'm hoping that this cursor is being shared um, on your screen. Um, but if you look, it is, okay, great, thank you. Um, the main thing I wanted to point out here um, on this slide um, is that you see here's our flu vaccine and our tetanus um, pertussis vaccines, and these are um, age appropriate for, for everybody. Um, as you move down the list here um, through zoster and HPV, um, I wanted to just draw to your attention the ones that we're mainly going to be focusing on this talk, which are our folks who have co-occurring um, medical um, comorbidities. And so um, We'll talk some about pregnancy in this talk. We'll talk about though um, kidney disease, liver disease, lung disease, um, and these can all um, increase um, due to um, different use disorders. And so we wanna keep in mind when we're seeing our patients in clinic that for instance, um, this pneumococcal 23 vaccine, which would normally be given at age um, 65, if you look at the folks who have, for instance, lung disease, chronic liver disease, we'd be giving them a first dose um, uh, earlier than, than that. So um, the other one I wanted to draw to your attention are the hepatitis A and B vaccines um, for chronic liver disease. Um, very important to make sure that we are vaccinating our patients there. So. Um, the next one. So just we're just going to talk about some different body systems, how they can be affected by one's um, use disorder. Um, this um, slide um, just kind of gives um, more of an uh, analytical look uh, for meta-analysis of medical disorders that have increased odds ratio. And if you look across, you see here, these are the, some, the um, illnesses that are described. And this is um, patients with a psychotic disorder, patients who have co-occurring substance use disorder, and patients who do not have a substance use disorder. And then over here, you see your patients with substance use disorder and no psychotic disorder. And really, all of these odds ratios increase. The only one that doesn't have a, um, 
uh, confidence interval um, that excludes one is the hypertension. So hypertension in patients with substance use disorder, no psychotic seems to, disorder seems to be the, the one um, represented here that um, is not uh, affected. So we'll talk briefly about the nervous system, um, ways that substance use can affect this. Head trauma can cause a range of problems, um, ranging from headaches to um, effects of uh, TBI or traumatic brain injury. Um, alcohol, um, large amounts of alcohol can deplete thiamine. This is why we want to have uh, patients who are ongoing um, in their use of alcohol beyond thiamine. Um, and uh, if it's severely depleted, this can cause uh, the syndrome known as Wernicke-Korsakoff, and that can, uh, syndrome may lead to coma and death without IV thiamine, so it's important to recognize that early. Um, seizures can result both from stimulant toxicity or from withdrawal from the alcohol or benzodiazepines, and it's estimated that about 14% of acute seizures are due in some way to drug use. And stroke risk is increased um, due to multiple substances, including tobacco, heavy alcohol use, and cocaine. The cardiovascular system, we see alcoholic cardiomyopathy, and this, the diagnosis of this depends on the history of chronic intake, um, usually heavy intake of over 80 grams per day for over 80 years, uh, sorry, for over five years. Um, chronic stimulant use is also responsible uh, for 5% of decompensated heart failure. Hypertension, we know, is related to uh, substance use as well. The um, alcohol um, and also nicotine um, provides uh, immediate release of norepinephrine and epinephrine, which can increase blood pressure. Atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia in adults. It does put people at increased risk of stroke. And one risk factor for that is heavy alcohol use and others tobacco. And then acute MI or heart attack, um, the risk of this we know declines when people quit smoking. So oftentimes we will discuss that as one of the reasons uh, medically to, um, to quit. Um, cocaine use also increases the risk of an MI. Um, it also increases the risk of aortic dissection and stroke. Respiratory system, so we see chronic bronchitis, COPD, emphysema, bronchospasm um, from inhaled drugs. We know that smoking causes lung cancer, has thousands of chemicals. Marijuana, we don't know as much about the long-term effects, but we know that it um, uh, may produce similar effects. It has more tar than cigarettes. And cocaine um, can cause uh, respiratory illness by um, burns of the upper airway, bronchospasm, um, alve alveolar hemorrhage, which is bleeding into the alveoli of the lungs, um, and also pulmonary edema or swelling. So opioids also have an effect on the respiratory system. As we know, they can cause respiratory suppression through the central nervous system, so decreasing the, will, the, the drive to breathe. Um, and Chronic opioid use can also uh, has an association with increased sleep apnea. Alcohol use can lead to aspiration pneumonia, so multiple effects of these substances. In the GI system, um, we see gastritis, about um, uh, uh, many cases of gastritis secondary to alcohol uh, intake, pancreatitis. Um, in the United States, about 30% of acute cases are due to alcohol. We see acute and chronic diarrhea causing malabsorption, um, also due to alcohol. Increased risk of GI cancers. This can also be compounded by tobacco use, increasing the risk of cancers. Um, constipation is a very common problem with our patients um, caused by opioids. Smoking can increase the risk of gastric reflux, and that's um, a direct effect of the nicotine can actually decrease LES pressure is the lower esophageal sphincter. So basically the connection between the esophagus and the stomach can relax and make it more likely for acid to come up and produce those symptoms, uh, ulcers as well. Um, moving along, so um, liver disorders, um, in particular, uh, of course, we see these with alcohol use, um, anything ranging from uh, fatty liver to cirrhosis. Um, the, the, the risk factors that are associated with the progression of fibrosis, so the, the, the chance that someone um, will become sick and develop actual scarring or cirrhosis of the liver, these increase with the amount of alcohol. Uh, females have a greater risk. Um, of uh, 
quick progression, certain genetic factors. If someone has co-incurring um, things that are affecting the liver, such as obesity, chronic viral hepatitis, or other hepatotoxin exposure, in addition to the al um, alcohol. And then we worry about um, complications of cirrhosis. So once someone has developed cirrhosis, they have an increased risk of developing liver cancer. Kidney disorders, um, we do uh, occasionally see from chronic alcohol use and cirrhosis, um, liver failure can then turn into something called a hepatorenal syndrome, where the kidneys fail, and this has very high mortality. Um, injection drug use can lead to uh, HIV-associated nephropathies. It can also um, lead to hepatitis C, um, which can cause a particular glomerulonephritis. Um, rhabdomyolysis, um, which is basically, and this is often related to cocaine use, it can be related to other substances if someone is, um, say, down and out for a long time due to their alcohol use. Um, but cocaine can cause prolong prolonged vasoconstriction of blood flow to the muscles, and that can in turn cause um, renal failure. And then we see acute renal failure as well related to certain club drugs, um, such as bath salts. Um, infectious diseases, we see increased rates of cellulitis, abscesses, um, endocarditis, um, which can lead to heart failure, um, pneumonia and tuberculosis. Um, we see higher rates of these within um, patients who are using substances, and then HIV, uh, hepatitis C in particular, um, we see a lot of in New Mexico. This is very small, um, and I'm not going to go through um, Every single line here, this is um, essentially copied from um, up to date just to give a sense of the importance of PrEP, which is HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, and how to approach this in patients who may be at high risk for um, for uh, transmitting HIV. Um, I will point out that before initiating, it's important to determine their eligibility, so you must uh, document the negative HIV test before, immediately before starting it. Um, and testing for acute HIV infection, if there's any um, symptoms consistent with that, um, or the patient has had high-risk exposure in the last four weeks. And we need to confirm that the patient um, is at a high, continued high risk uh, for HIV transmission. Um, we also need to confirm that their GFR or their uh, kidney function um, is what that represents is over 60. You can see some other recommended tests there um, to kind of scan through that, um, but these would not be contraindications. And then for beginning um, treatment um, with Truvada in general, you don't want to prescribe more than a 90-day supply um, because you want to have your patient um, have their HIV testing every three months. And then, of course, to um, continue to provide um, counseling risk on risk reduction and the importance of adherence to PrEP. And then just to mention um, the importance of hep C treatment, um, it's become very straightforward um, compared to how it was uh, a decade ago. Um, it involves mainly ensuring that your patient can take a medication daily for eight to 12 weeks. Um, the most common uh, medications that we are using now um, at least here in uh, New Mexico, are these direct-acting antivirals, and these include um, glicaprevir is um, Mavaret, Sofosbuvir, Velpatosphere, Oplusa, Ledipasphere, Sofosbuvir, Harvoni, and these are regimens that a lot of patients have concerns based on um, hearing about prior experiences with older medications such as interferon, and so oftentimes just kind of explaining how these um, don't tend to cause the side effects um, that people are concerned about. Sometimes people get a little, maybe a little nausea or a headache, but usually they need to take them with food anyway, and usually they're very well tolerated, um, and the, the treatment regimen is, is very brief. Um, so people do quite well with these. They're not yet approved in pregnancy nor breastfeeding, so we wait till the patient's done with that. And otherwise, then, we offer it to all of our patients who have positive viral load, and we've confirmed that they have a chronic infection. And then we review the use of needle exchange to help prevent uh, transmission or if, they, uh, to, if they've been treated uh, to help prevent uh, the likelihood of reinfection. Um, and then going on to discuss just a few more physical consequences. So physical trauma is um, higher in um, people who use drugs. Um, alcohol is involved in over 50% of major traumas and in a third of fatal MBAs. Those who are injured um, tend to have an increased severity of injury if the use of alcohol or drugs was involved. And we know from systematic reviews that it, there's um, 
an increase in childhood trauma secondary to alcohol use and also in intimate partner violence. Touching upon pregnancy and fetal development, um, a lot of these obviously are talks that um, could each last an hour. So again, this is just sort of a brief overview. But um, these are some substance use estimates nationally. Um, during pregnancy, these are probably um, C to C data that's uh, probably on the low side of the estimates. And I will say that I, I, did, I meant to include tobacco up there, which is at about, per the CDC 2014 data, about 9.4. I'm sorry, about 8.4% in pregnancy. Alcohol, 9.4%, marijuana, 9 to 15%, opioids, 2%, cocaine, a range there, 1 to 10%. Um, I'll, I will say, too, that um, we tend to see um, in the postpartum period um, women at a higher risk for increasing the use of these substances. So oftentimes they may decrease um, during pregnancy, but the postpartum period is a high risk time um, to work with people um, through neonatal abstinence syndrome. So again, this is the physical physical signs of withdrawal, dependence in the newborn, um, and um, we uh, encourage breastfeeding in women who are on methadone or buprenorphine um, as long as they are HIV negative and their urine drug screens negative for benzodiazepines, cocaine, and marijuana. We know that smoking during pregnancy can lead to low birth weight um, and that about a third of SIDS cases may be prevented by uh, quitting um, cigarettes in pregnancy. Um, about 40% of women who smoke uh, prior to their pregnancy quit during pregnancy and about 60% of women um, who use alcohol quit while pregnant. Um, the fetal alcohol spectrum disorders mentioned this um, because it's probably um, under Diagnose it represents a spectrum um, uh, and is diagnosed by things such as slow growth, um, development, uh, sometimes there are um, facial abnormalities, and um, it's diagnosed in these um, defects, birth defects, and, and behavioral cognitive abnormalities that cannot otherwise be explained. For treating um, different substance use disorders in pregnancy, um, again, it's a very high-risk time and we want to support people um, if, as much as we can with uh, treatment. Um, in tab for tobacco use, um, there's not a clear guideline and expert opinions vary in terms of providing nicotine replacement and medication for cravings, but the um, general consensus is, seems uh, to be to treat, um, to help um, women not smoke in their pregnancy. Alcohol use, um, the medications that we have for alcohol use disorder have not been um, approved in pregnancy. We do um, try to um, engage women um, in uh, individual and group therapy. Um, same for stimulant use disorder, which we do not uh, have uh, FDA approved medications uh, for pregnant or non-pregnant individuals. Um, opioid use disorder, we know the evidence is very strong for treatment with methadone and buprenorphine, and we encourage all women with opioid use disorder, if they have not started um, one of these medications, to start during pregnancy. Um, the MOTHER study, um, which I believe was published in 2010, was a six-site um, RCT that showed um, decreased uh, neonatal abstinence syndrome symptoms with buprenorphine um, when compared uh, with methadone, so decreased length of hospital stay from about 11 to 4 days, and decreased dosage of morphine in those um, infants. Um, but both methadone um, and uh, buprenorphine are safe um, and encouraged in pregnancy. The general overview of treatment options um, for all patients um, and some of those for the, for the alcohol are non-pregnant patients. So for tobacco use disorder, of course, we offer nicotine replacement therapy, usually a combination of long and short acting. Um, and then bupropion um, and varenicline are medications that can help decrease cravings. For alcohol use disorder, um, there is a our uh, therapy in addition to um, one of these uh, medications. So our naltrexone or long-acting naltrexone is our gold standard acamprosit in the case of um, liver disease and disulfiram is, doesn't have evidence um, 
that's an abuse um, for its um, use. However, in controlled um, observed settings, it can be useful. Um, and then our opioid treatment therapies you have there, the buprenorphine, methadone, naltrexone, and um, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, other forms of um, psychotherapy. Stimulants, we don't have the medications for, but we um, rely heavily upon our therapies, including contingency management. And then marijuana and benzodiazepines are other medications to keep in mind that can affect your um, patient's health and which we generally try to um, engage patients both in therapy and also treatment of potential underlying causes. For instance, if someone has a benzodiazepine use disorder, making sure that we're addressing what they may have um, been self-treating, perhaps prior PTSD or anxiety. So in summary, please, um, 1230, so I'm going to try to wrap it up. Um, screen for medical conditions that have an increased prevalence in people with substance use disorders. Vaccinate, vaccinate, and uh, be familiar with how substance use disorders can affect specific health conditions. Also be aware of the effect of substance use on pregnancy and fetal development, and be comfortable discussing treatment options for um, some of the disease processes associated with substance use. And with that, um, I guess we might have time for